So recursion's a new type of loop writing for us. If you think back, we first learned about the while loop, then we learned about the for loop, which is basically a while loop, but it included a built-in initializing expression and step expression. There's never really an instance where you have to use a while loop or you have to use a for loop, okay? There's times when one make, might make more sense or might be a little more elegant or easier to understand, but there's never really a reason why one would work and the other one wouldn't. Okay, most of you just write for loops now. I still do see some students writing while loops and that's fine. Well, it's the same thing with recursion. Recursion's another way to write a loop that is technically never mandatory. There's not like a problem where you just can't do it another way and only recursion works. Now, that being said, there are times when using recursion is going to be a lot more elegant, a lot easier to understand, and maybe even simpler to implement. When we learn about sorting routines, the most difficult sorting routine we're going to learn is called a merge sort. And a merge sort uses recursive code. All right, so what does that mean to say that it uses recursive code? What that means is, is that you're going to write a method, and then within the body of that method, you will call that actual method. That creates a loop because this loop will have to resolve itself at some point or else it would just go on forever and ever. If, a, if a, the body of a method calls its own method, it's just going to create an endless circle unless there is a way to get out of there. And we're going to learn about all that stuff. But that's where the looping process comes in and that's how you can identify something as being recursive is that a method calls itself. This is different than like what we learned in inheritance when you have polymorphism and you can jump from a subclass to a superclass where they have same method names. This is a little different. We're talking about one single method calling itself. Okay, that's how you create recursive code in, in most computer science programs. All right, and like I said, there's never really a reason you absolutely need recursive code but sometimes it's easier to write like the merge sort and we're going to learn about the merge sort so we need to sort of understand recursion. Uh, you're probably going to see two to three to four recursive problems on the, on the multiple choice AP test. So they like to give you a recursive method, have you read it, and then say what it's going to do. Like what is it going to print? That's a typical question and usually there's two or three or four of them. And we'll look at some of the least problems, okay? All right, so let's, let's take a look. Like they said here, the classic factorial problem. Let's, let's revisit a problem that we wrote together previously. So uh, I've got just a basic tester class here. I've gone ahead and imported system, public class tester. I've got a main method. And then all I'm doing in my main method is I'm making three method calls. So... I'm calling factorial. First, I'm giving it the value of 5, and then 6, and then 3. And with what you've learned about factorials from middle school or Algebra 1, Algebra 2, wherever you learn this, if you want to know what factorial 5 is, the way I was taught, you start with 5, and you keep multiplying by one less number until you reach 1, and then you find that total product, that's your factorial. So 5 factorial should be 120, 6 factorial 720, and so on. Way back when, probably September or October, when we first learned about loops, I'm sure I made you guys write a program just like this. We probably weren't writing it with a method back then, but it's the same idea. Okay, so here's my factorial method. I'm going to give the method an integer, and it's going to give me back an integer, which is going to represent the factorial. All right, and to do this, I just made a, a variable where I could keep that running product. I called it fact. I initialized it to 1. Now, I wrote a backwards for loop. 
Is that required to go backwards? No. It just made a little more sense to me because, like I said, when I learned factorials, probably in middle school, I was kind of taught you start with the number and work your way back to one. You could multiply one to five. It wouldn't matter. You get the same answer. This is just a little bit more representative of the way I learned it. Okay? Every time through, I multiplied the existing factorial by the new number produced by the loop, and then I got my answer. I hope if I put this on a test, you guys could write that code. I, I don't know. Okay. That would be my, my hope. I've still seen a big issue on tests and quizzes, by the way, where a lot of students are initializing a variable. Sorry. They're declaring a variable, but failing to initialize it before they use it. You got to remember, that's going to result in an immediate compile error. You can't simply declare a variable and go on to use it or return it. You must give that variable a value, especially if you're only using it in a for loop where it might not ever get used. So often I see students want to initialize every number to zero. It works a lot of the time, but it doesn't work every time. So we've seen, you know, other cases. Where here's, a, here's a case where initializing to zero would be like a really bad mistake because if you, once you multiply by zero, you got zero. You're stuck. Like, it doesn't matter if you could multiply by a million. It's still zero. Okay? So... Here's a case where we want to use what we call the multiplicative identity, which is one. Okay, so a little careful there, yeah? Yeah. Okay, yeah, so we got one. Now this should work. We should get, uh, let's see if we get the correct numbers now. All right, those look pretty good. Okay, where, do, where does recursion come into this? I thought we were going to learn something new today. All right, so let's, now I'm going to rewrite this same process using a recursive approach. Okay, so I've, I've commented out my previous code, and I'm going to write some recursive code. Now, remember what recursion means. Our, like our book says, recursion means you're calling a method from itself. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to write a return statement. I'm not going to use a for loop or a while loop, but I'm still going to create a loop. And what I'm going to return is num, that's my parameter that gets passed in, times, I'm going to call the factorial method. Okay, I'm going to call the factorial method, and I'm going to give it the next number that I want an answer to. Now let's just pause for a second and imagine what, what is this going to do? Like what sort of chain of events is this going to create? Okay, so if the initial call is made to num5, then we're going to return five times factorial five minus one, which is really just four. So I'm just going to write a four there, okay? Now, we've been taught all year, like, you only get to return once. Once you return, your method stops, and that's true. But we can't return an unknown, right? And that's what factorial 4 is to the computer at this point. It understands that you want to return 5 times something, but it doesn't know what that something is. In recursion, we call this a stack issue. This is going to create some code that is not fully resolved. And we can't make our return until we have resolved what that issue is. Okay? So what would happen at this point is you would make a call to the factorial method with 4. Well, what would happen if you passed a 4 into this parameter right here? That 4 would show up here for num, and it would also show up here. And so what's going to happen is we're going to see a 4 times factorial 3. And this is all entering what we call this stack. Now, again, we, we only get to return once. You can only return one single time. 
you can't return once and then change your mind or return once and then throw in another number. You only get to do it one time. And you can't make that return until you know what it is. And I don't know what it is yet that I'm looking to return. Because I don't know what factorial 3 is yet. So what would happen? Well, factorial 3 would issue a new method call. And you would see factorial 3. You would see 3's go in to those nums. And so like right here, I would get... For factorial 3, a 3 times factorial 2. Now, I'm starting to get a little scared because is this process ever going to stop? No. It's going to call factorial 1 and then 0 and then negative 1 and then negative 2. Now, I understand once I multiply by 0, it's going to be 0, but this is going to go on forever. When we first learned about writing loops, we wrote a lot of infinite loops, you know, on accident. Infinite <coughs> loops are bad. We try to avoid them. Well, when you write recursive code, if you're not careful, you're going to create an infinite loop. So you need to incorporate a way for your method to end, for it to terminate. All right? And in recursion, we call that the base case. In loop writing, we typically call that the control expression. In recursion, we typically call this the base case, but it's, it's real similar thinking. Okay, this is what we have previously called a control expression or a stopping rule. And usually it's going to involve the word if. All right, and so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to write an if. And I'm going to say once num reaches a certain value, that's when I'm going to look to quit making recursive calls. And correct. The number is going to be 1, is what I'm going to originally put there. I might, I might modify this in a minute, but for right now, I'm going to put the number 1 there because like we've seen you know, in, in algebra, middle school, whatever, that's how a factorial works. You keep multiplying until you reach 1. Okay, So I put the number 1 in, and if I go back to my notepad here for a second, right? let's imagine factorial 2, the next call made would be 2 times factorial 1. Now, notice all of those factorial calls would have skipped the if statement. Now, I'm going to make a call. What do I want factorial 1 to do? Okay, well, this, this is weird. This is weird the first time you see it. But what I'm going to do in that if statement, when I hit factorial 1, is I'm actually just going to return a 1. Now, I know that looks strange because you might be thinking, wait, doesn't that mean the answer is going to be 1? Well, yes and no. Okay, if the problem had started right there, so if the original question was, what's factorial 1? Well, then we could have answered that original question. We would have just said, oh, the answer is 1. Okay, like no big deal, right? And you guys would be, oh, that's easy. Well, now we can actually answer for the first time what is factorial 2. Because remember what factorial 2 was? It was 2 times a call to factorial 1. Well, we know factorial 1 now. It's not an unresolved issue. Factorial 1 is 1. So therefore, factorial 2 is 2. Right? See that? We, we actually know this answer now. And as a result, now we can answer factorial 3. What is factorial 3? It's 3 times a call to factorial 2, which is 2. So factorial 3 is 6. Now I can answer factorial 4, because factorial 4 is a 4 times a call to factorial 3, which is 6. So therefore, factorial 4 is 24. And I've worked my way all the way back up to the original return, which was asking for 5 times an unknown factorial, which is now known. So this is going to actually take 5 times 24, and we're going to get back 120. And let's, let's see if it actually works when we give this a run. Okay? All right, and sure enough, so we got 120. We got 720 for factorial 6. We got 6 for factorial 3. The stack was able to resolve itself and give an answer. And 
it's very important to understand how that base case worked. Once we asked for factorial 1, we said 1. Now, it doesn't return 1 at that point because that return 1 was embedded within this stack of unresolved method calls. It then had to go back and resolve factorial 2. It then had to go back and resolve factorial 3, which resolved factorial 4, which finally resolved factorial 5. In a stack of recursive code, the last call in is the first one out. So after I made the call to factorial 1, I started working backwards up the stack. Okay, and that's going to be important when we create some more complex recursive code in the future. Now, if you wanted to, you could include the word else here. It's not mandatory in this setting because it is an integer return method. Um, once it makes that final return, it shuts down the method. Um, so once we made this call, which did not invoke any more recursive calls, that's what allowed this process to stop. If I put the word else in there, it's fine. It's not going to cause any problems. Now, if you're kind of nitpicky here, if you're on the math team, you might be thinking to yourself, wait, Mr. Zerla, I got one for you. What about factorial zero? Huh? Oh, no. No problem. No problem. I'll just change my base case. I'll let it reach zero. And, and this should produce the proper factorials that we'd like to see. Let's, let's check it out. Ah, see, factorial, that's, that's actually correct, right? You might remember that from middle school. Factorial zero is one, uh, you know, okay. You can look it up on Google if you don't believe me. Okay, okay, look it up on Wikipedia. Wikipedia's always right, okay? All right, well, that's for Algebra 2 honors to worry about. Steve, Stephen will give us a lecture later on why factorial zero is one. All right, okay, any questions on the factorial? Yes, Grady. Uh, well, it would need to be incorporated into the base case. Yeah, because it would need a way out. Now, negative factorials aren't really defined. So like, if I say what's factorial negative 3, that's going to crash my program. But it's also not a real meaningful value to begin. And I, I could adjust this to avoid it from crashing. But there really isn't a, a sensical return there. <laughs> All right. Now, let's try another one here. But before I do that, I want to just point out in the book, there's like a lot of really, I think there's 10 examples, and then there's 10 problems at the end. So like if you look, let's look at this one here, adder 7, okay? And let me, let me bring back the notepad for a second. All right, so if we were going to try this one here, adder 7. So what would happen is, is you'd make a call to adder 7, and that would open up a recursive sequence because 7 is not less than 0. So what, it, what would you'd have to go to the else statement. You'd return 7 plus adder, oops, whoa, let me try that again. Adder 7 <laughs> equals 7 plus adder 5. Now, I know it's confusing because we usually think once you make a return, it's like immediate. You just give your answer. But that's not actually true here because you can't return an unknown quantity. So before you can make your return, you have to address the fact of what is adder 5. Okay, adder 5 actually sends out a new call and it says give me 5 plus adder 3. That sends out a new method call. That says give me 3 plus adder 1. Now notice how none of these method calls have hit that base case yet. To hit the base case, you need a number that's less than or equal to 0. So I've skipped the if statement every time and gone straight to the else. Well, once you make a call to adder 1, okay, now something a little different is going to happen. You're going to say give me 1 plus adder negative one. Now, add or negative one. Let's imagine that the problem started right there. If I put that code on the test and I say system out print add or negative one, 
there's not really even any recursion to take place. Because if I said give me add or negative one, you guys should just go, oh, that's 30. Like that's okay, I got that's easy, right? Add or negative one is just 30. And now we actually know add or one, okay, is 31. And now we know add or three is 34. And now we know add or five is 39. And now we've got our answer, 46. And so for the first time, we can actually make that return. I know we want to return right away, but if we start opening up more unknowns, we have to resolve them before we can make that return. So you can't make a return until you know everything. Now you're ready. This would print 46, okay? There's a lot of good examples in the book, and the author does a good job explaining them. So I, I encourage you to read through them. Now, we've only got a half hour today, so I'm not going to get to what we call a stack issue. And I'm going to have to get to that tomorrow. So you might want to skip a few questions in the homework tonight, like seven, or I think it's, I think it's six, eight, and nine. Let me, let me double check. Yeah, you might want to skip six, eight, and nine, unless you want to read about it on your own. But I'll, I'll explain that to tomorrow as best I can. All right, let's, we're going to do another one here together, though. Let's try this. So I'm going to say out.print ln. I'm going to make a method. I'm just going to call it uh, mm for mystery method. And I'm going to pass it a 6. Okay? And then let's write mystery method here, mm together. It's supposed to be kind of scary. Okay, so mystery method. All right, here's how mystery method's going to work. I'm going to say if you call mystery method with a 0, I'm going to give you a 1. All right? If you call mystery method with a 1, I'm going to give you a 3. And if you give me anything else, I'm just going to have like a generic default return down here. I'm going to give you back the number plus mystery method num minus one. Okay, plus mystery method num minus two. All right, so this, this is a doubly recursive call here. Okay, all right. So what is this going to do? Now, I know you guys can run it and get the answer. Let's see if we can predict, you know, what's going to happen here. All right, so I'm going to call back up our notepad. And let's see if we can figure out what's going to happen in this method call. Now, the first method call is made to mystery method 6. And what that is going to do is say, give me a 6. Because, okay, first of all, see how that, it doesn't go into either if statement, right? It's not a 1 or a 0. So it goes straight to the bottom default return. And it says, give me back the number 6 plus a call to mystery method 5 plus a call to mystery method 4. Well, are we ready to give our answer yet? No, because we don't know what mystery method 5 or mystery method 4 are. So, and the same thing with the computer. It's going to have to resolve those issues before it's ready to give an answer. So it's going to say, oh, well, I got to figure out mystery method five. To do that means I got to know mystery methods four and three. Okay. And then it's going to, oh, man, I don't know what that is. Will, okay. I, if I want to get mystery method four, I got to know four plus mystery method three. Oh, man, this is starting to get annoying. All right. There might be a better way to do this, and I'll, sh I'll show you if we have time. Now, mystery method three is a little bit more interesting. Okay, a little, there's actually some good news coming from mystery method three. Okay, and, and what it is is that if, if we wanted mystery method three, it would be three plus mystery method two plus mystery method one. Now, here's the good news. I actually know mystery method one like if we just started there and i asked you what's mystery method one you guys could answer me 
Yeah, mystery method one is three. That's one of the base cases. That would return three and it would quit. It wouldn't open any more recursion. And so like it would just become a three immediately. You wouldn't need to do any like additional work to resolve that. And, and so now if you ask for mystery method two, it's kind of similar because mystery method two involves two, right, plus mystery method one plus mystery method zero. And we actually know both of those. And so as a result, now we can start resolving this stack, okay? Because mystery method zero, we know that value. I'll put it underneath so that we don't, I don't overwrite it. Mystery method one, I know, is three. Mystery method zero, I know, is one. So I actually know that this is six. So I, I know the value now of mystery method two, right? It's actually a six. If I came back up here, I could actually put that, like I could go, oh, okay, I actually know that now. Mystery method two is six. So therefore, mystery method three is 12. And I could see how I, I could, remember, you resolve your stacks in reverse. This is a 12. This isn't actually the full truth. The, the three would, res the, the right left issue would kind of show up too if we were doing like a merge sort. I'll have to show you guys that another day. All right, this would be 22. I'm probably gonna make a mistake before I'm done here. So if I make a mistake, try to catch me. This is 22. I made a mistake in zero period, but I don't have my coffee before I meet them. It's not fair. Uh, this is 39. Okay, so this is 39. Mystery method four is 22. Oh, so I think we got it now. What do we got? 61 and 6, 67. I, I don't know. Is there any way that that's right? Let's, oh, well, we can find out. Let's run it. We'll see. Yeah, it is 67. It is. Now, I think there's a better way to do that problem. Personally, like, like if I was going to do that problem, instead of working backwards to the base cases, I think I would actually start the problem at the base cases and work forward. So if I actually said mystery method zero, okay, is one. Mystery method two, uh, one is three. I could figure out mystery method two pretty easily because it's two plus the previous two values, right? And now if I wanted mystery method three, it's three plus the two previous terms. You guys probably did stuff like this in algebra two, like in a recursion sequence building. So now like if you wanted term four, it's four plus the two previous terms, okay? So 22, and if you wanted five, it's uh, five plus the two previous terms, and we're almost there, I know, okay, 39. And now if you wanted mystery method six, it's six plus the two previous terms. And anyway, we're gonna get the same answer. So I, to me, that's probably what I would do. If I saw a doubly recursive sequence, I'd probably go forward instead of backward. Oh, yeah.